Hey, 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 all right, Wednesday people, it is vibrant time. We've got the, let's see if I can say this word I made up. We've got the four horsemen of the symbolic apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so joining me, we've got on the reg, Slick Dissident, a.k.a. Gabriel, and the brilliant Mario from Symbolic Studies, and our good buddy from the fake country down under, L.C. King. The real question on everyone's mind, I'm pretty sure, is which one of us is which horseman? I was thinking maybe I could be war since I'm an Aries, but what do you guys think? It does I'm make sense. That. Yep, exactly. I'm obviously so warlike. You got to let me ride the red horse every once in a while, though, man. A red horse, that's freaking awesome. <laughs> you can have yeah, it, man. So, what, how, how's everybody doing? I'm really solid. I had a really great day. The The weather is really picking up over here. So I'm getting more sun and I definitely need more of that in my life. Sweet. Nice. Yeah, I can say the same, except this last week, it's been nothing but thunderstorms and rain. But last week, I almost exclusively just screwed around outside and didn't uh, do a lot of work. But I got a lot of reading done. Nice. So maybe we'll uh, get to talk about some books we've all been digging into. Excellent. Yeah, uh, I've been playing outside myself, uh, and a couple of my sprouting beds uh, might have got exposed a little too soon. Uh, maybe they're waterlogged. I'm not sure, but had uh, a couple beds of uh, uh, tomatoes and cucumbers went all limp and soggy, and they're dead. So I'm starting starting over. Just put new seeds in last night. That's what's up. Mm -hmm. Mine are all still indoors. I've not really been very successful the last couple of years, so wish me luck. Well, it's getting you? cold the, where I am. Farmer there, Lucas. Yeah, it's getting cold. It was nearly frosty this morning, so I was freezing. But um, yeah, so everything's slowing down on the farm, but still been sort of chipping away at it, you know. Cool, cool, cool. So <clears throat> I don't know about you guys, but as far as like symbolic studies go, I've been on a real Egypt kick lately. Mm -hmm. So here's the books that I'm currently digging into. We got The Power of Then, Revealing Egypt's Lost Wisdom by our buddy Howdy McCoskey. This nice. is a treasure trove right here. Because not only is it giving you some symbolic literacy to things that are way more original versions of stuff that we have now, although maybe not the original, uh, it's also got this really grounded spiritual aspect to it where he's dismissing or disputing the modern beliefs that people have about ancient Egypt and about their religion. You know, like very importantly that they weren't actually polytheists in the sense of believing that there were literally multiple gods. But he says very clearly it is indicated that the idea of the different gods was a teaching tool. And I like that a lot, but they represent universal forces and powers that could be tapped into by calling on that symbolic archetype. I really enjoy the book so far. Actually, <laughs> like I had a dream uh, after I read this section of the book where he's describing the different bodies that the Egyptians talk about, the different layers of your body, like the Ba and the Ka, etc. And there was uh, one particular layer of the body that had to do with receiving and being able to connect to like higher intelligences and get taught by them. And I read this chapter and that very night I had this crazy dream where I was like getting a sermon in a crazy cathedral about Egyptian Gnosticism. And after I had this lesson from the teachers, then they were like, okay, time to go practice astral travel. And I got into a bed in the dream and I left my body and it was like inception level. It was like a dream within a dream, but I'm like out of body in the dream and looking at my body and I flew around and did all kinds of stuff. I can't remember other than I know for sure. I high-fived Baphomet one time when I was flying by. Real quick. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. As you do. Wow. Yeah. Were, do. Have you been taking mugwort before you go to sleep? No, uh, okay. usually honey. Well, pretty often honey, maybe not usually. I do an acetylcholine supplement, which is okay. like a neurotransmitter, which is supposed to increase dream recall or 
formation of memories or things like that focus. Mm -hmm. And I also do pretty frequently some melatonin because some nights it's like late nights and then other nights I want to wake up early. So my sleep schedule is way up and down throughout the week. So melatonin oh, yeah. probably helps a lot with the uh, kicking into dreams. Nice. Well, I've been doing, I've been taking that mugwort that uh, Michelle sent and it is amazing on the dreams. I highly, highly recommend it. Everybody go get you some. It's good stuff. Just getting back to like that, um, the Egyptian gods as teachers or, you know, encodings. Um, I've been sort of figuring out the same thing, which is basically that these gods are, um, the names at least in the geomatria are actually de derived from um, geometry and um, musical sort of um, aspects as well. So harmonies and things like that. And um, I've basically been reading this book, um, which is, I don't know if you can see it probably there, sun's shining on it. But it's called um, Jesus Christ, um, Son of God, S-U-N, um, and it's by David Fiddler. And he goes through some really, really interesting things about the geometry of the old Greek names and how some of these stories are basically encodings of um, these types of geometries and music is involved. And so really, really good book. Um for people to check out as well that's awesome um i have a book to share as well if we're going down that road and it is uh at the center of the world polar symbolism discovered in celtic norse and other ritualized landscapes which anyone who has seen me on any of these streams really will know my love of all things northern and uh, polar based and the author is john michelle and because i picked this up i started looking into him and he actually is kind of a beast and i guess in certain communities he was kind of a big thing and he passed away a few years ago and he just makes a really good case that you know it was uh really a primary thing um to be concerned and aware of what the center was of your community or culture or region or state and that the priests and kings and lawmakers were also very much concerned with this central axis of uh of your town or village or what have you and he actually makes the case that um when you lose that polar axis point in your community the physical one that things go haywire and things kind of um, can kind of uh, devolve from there. So he has different cases in this book talking about various tribes that had like a polar axis symbol that they would travel around with. And if it accidentally got lost or stolen or broken or something like that, that this would be the beginning of the end for these guys. And so this idea of having an empire or a country or a city and really honing in on the exact center point of the country was like a very, very significant spiritual sort of thing. So he has all sorts of different examples in here, but wow. it lines up like perfectly with a lot of the things I'm looking into right now. That's that makes me think of upright and in good standing. Sure. It makes me think of a leanable rights, you know, the lean putting a lean on your rights. Right. Cause it, right. Cause it, would require that right angle to be upright. Yeah, mm. sure. It makes so, me think of the idea that, um, I guess this might've been like a Roman thing that there was a pole or a post in the middle of a town. And that correct, was yeah. where you would go and post notices about this and that. So kind of like reorienting this idea of a central pole or axis to be revolving around the state and their decrees and whatnot. But also I think citizens would make posts there as well it's probably where we get the word post or mail oh yeah exactly no that that's what i'm thinking too and so it really is this fascinating uh sort of subject that i'm completely enthralled with because it's actually connecting a lot of different dots for me so as an example people wonder like you know in jerusalem 
with the temple mount and everything it's like why they get so heated about this one location well it's like that's why they're part of that religion is because they still have this cosmic access point you know that everyone acknowledges and takes pilgrimages to you know and then of course there's mecca in saudi arabia and so uh these polar access points this was like a known science you know um to different priesthoods and stuff back in the day and it's just this kind of lost sort of thing and so he even talks about how architecture you know does not reflect this but back in the day you know you had a hut and you had this central fire and you sat around the fire and that this central location was like the polar axis for your family you know and so this idea of a cosmic polar axis really um there's so many different fractals of it so there's the uh, cosmic central axis on a global level on an earth-based level as uh you know there's a central axis for various countries and then uh, states have them too and then smaller communities and then even your home you know and your family so i'm really digging this idea though of a lot of the things he's putting out there so maybe we can get into it more later yeah i've noticed that sort of thing as well where they're sort of replicating that uh, mount meru type um idea in different towns and places as well so that it, you know the the jerusalem or whatever it is but it's just yeah replicated in different areas yeah um, that's right yeah that exactly that sounds fascinating mate yeah for sure you know it's typically a mound it can be a stone it can be a tree it can be a pillar typically it's something phallic that is driven into the earth you know so the dome of the rock it's called the dome of the rock you know at the temple mount in jerusalem because there's this big rock <laughs> underneath the dome and then within this rock there's a hole you know mm -hmm. and so usually where there's a pole you'll find a hole so there's a lot of just uh cosmic axis mundi symbolism that's encoded into all of this stuff you know and i think inherently too humans just kind of have this like understanding of this in a way of wanting a city center or cultural center a community center if you will yeah that was the a other thing, thing in native american cultures that they had this idea that their land was sacred because what happened there happened everywhere and that every place in the earth if you will is the center if you symbolically let it be and that's yes. kind of the interesting thing about the fractal nature of reality that it does kind of work out that way anyway um another thing that comes to mind about the pole other than the idea of the <laughs> the dome of the rock and the rock being symbolic of the lord rock and lord have a lot of etymological connections as a word which maybe we'll get into but uh clint richardson one of my favorite law biblical scholarly decoder guys he has a really profound theory it's one way of reading the bible not the only way of reading the bible but that in the new testament in particular it's constantly being referenced that god does not uh respect persons right or does, which means doesn't see persons and persons we know is a legal term referring to your straw man and then we have like biblical verses such as render under unto caesar what is caesar's and clint has a particularly cool way of interpreting the crucifixion story as being allegorical for actually taking your straw man as an identity on paper and crucifying it to the post or the pole and crucify the meaning of that word has to do with like actually removing something from yourself in the original etymology when you crucify something it's like detaching it so one way of one way of reading the christ story would be that he was actually killing his straw man that's what he sacrificed on the cross and uh that's what gave him like you know the the symbolic ascension that's very interesting uh, because the straw man is uh, one of the ingredients to the Wizard of Oz decode that we've been cooking up lately. Uh, so I find that one very interesting because he's literally up on a post. Yeah, no, that is fascinating. Uh, let me read this real quick. It's, it's very short, just two sentences. As the locus of divine law, the cosmic pole is the most powerful symbol of authority and is regarded as the only legitimate source of human laws. Its main images include the scepter, the measuring, the measuring rod, excuse me, the king post, 
and the central pillar, which I think is fascinating. I don't know if anyone else has heard that from people who are really interested in, in law on a symbolic level, the idea of the post or pillar um, being kind of like this thing. And so he even goes into it saying that, you know, um, kings passed down this information. This was like a, a thing that was like a, a tradition, right? And they basically believe that if you wield that rod or scepter, then you're like speaking on behalf of that cosmic access point, right? That's giving you like divine authority to reign, essentially. The other thing that comes to mind for me is um, there's a god Terminus, and that was all about the rock. Um, also, um, you know, you can break it down, but generally it, it also is a way of marking out land, measuring land. So um, you have that one central point, and then from there you can work out where your land resides. So um, that sort of brings that measurement into, into place as well. Exactly. Yeah. And they were saying, or he was saying in this book too, that some of these older measuring rods, this, this uh, pole or shaft, uh, it was designated to be a certain height. And that when they refer to whether or not someone can measure up uh, to something, that this is an old reference to that measuring rod. And when you think of the rod, you really should think of the cosmic axis or the center. Okay. That's a great image. Yeah. So this is Wikipedia. We keep idea there image for terminus and gabriel do you notice other than the two pillars that you've got like some mermaid looking angelic serpentine ladies at the bottom and then the words concedo whatever that is in latin in v i l l i it Moving. says it means i yield no ground which also has extremely re large relevance for the idea of like you know maritime law versus being on the land so to speak interesting yes. image and what Every, is it with this uh above it is this the the barrier is this the fence yeah that's yep yeah, that's the terminus that's the altar everything I've, everything that's been said over the past like two minutes has just been placenta 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 <laughs> <laughs> in my ears but uh so yes terminus uh definitely relates to uh, that placenta, that beginning point in, um, Lucas, is that, uh, that holiday, is it in, uh, January or February that Terminus is observed? Now? Oh, now you're pushing me. It's been a while since I looked at it. February um, 23rd. Oh, nice. There you go. So there's a two, two, three. That's an interesting liminal space in the Zodiac too. Uh-huh. But you're, you're spot on with the placenta thing, Gabe. Um, you know, because the navel is the center of our body symbolically, right? And so this relates to the omphalos, uh, right, which was the concept of the center. And then also um, there's a few different, oh, Tabor, I know is another name for the navel, which I believe that might be Greek. I could be mistaken, but that was interesting to me when I learned that because in Portland, we have a Mount Tabor and there's actually a underground facility within it and my guess is that at one point it was probably the center of town you know so if you travel around and you start looking for these central locations uh you're gonna find them so london has uh the london stone and they're all over the place so a lot of ancient old towns and cities and stuff like this was a very big deal i know in dublin they had this huge gigantic like needle looking thing you can see it from all over the place which very interestingly they have a hellfire club like right outside the city limits it might be within technically the city limits but it's kind of like in the countryside or whatever and the hellfire club the window was looking directly at that needle so it was looking directly at the center of town which i thought was fascinating Damn, that is fascinating. They're definitely channeling some mojo at the needle for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, you, bo you brought up the on fellas. You beat me to it. I was going to bring it up, but it's um, that one relates to like cre creation stories as well. And when you break down the encoding of the name, you get, you know, 1111, and then basically you can get some geometry out of it, which is um, which would be like the Star of David. So you've got the, the masculine and the feminine principle joined together. So that's what these sort of 
that on fellas would be symbolic of. And you do see that with some of those, um, uh, you know, your, your obelisks and stuff, and they'll have the um, vesica down below and things like that. So in general, it is an omphalos. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Jo joining of the two. Yeah. Yeah. A lot, a lot of times, too, these city centers or village centers or whatever will have a feminine aspect to them. So like underneath or like really close, there will be a cave or something to that effect, something uh, very feminine that almost acts like a womb or something. That nice balance there. Uh, recently, somebody made a correlation to um, Death Valley and that th there's a nearby mountain range um, as uh, the two extremes of the country because it's like the highest mountain right next to the lowest low point of the, of the whole country. So in a strange way, that kind of makes uh, Death Valley the omphalus of the United States, in topographically speaking. Interesting. I hadn't heard that. So just imagine, by the way, psychologically, the power of growing up and feeling as though you have a connection to the cosmos via the tradition you're a part of. And it's so highly regarded that people, it's like um, a once in a lifetime sort of thing to actually go and visit it, you know? And so it, even if you convert to Judaism or something, so then now you have Jerusalem and the Temple Mount and the Wailing Wall and all that kind of stuff to, to look forward to and to go to, or same thing with Islam, you know? I have a buddy that he converted over um, and he went to Mecca, you know? And so I just think that there's something there that is just so powerful that I encourage people to um, almost just acknowledge this dynamic. And I think you can create your own cosmic pillar. I think that's kind of the point sort of thing uh, in your heart or soul or within your home or your a little area around you. You know, all of these different cultures and groups who have said that they are the center of creation, they're actually not wrong. That's kind of the ironic thing about it. Yeah. I mean, well, you do have the reflection in yourself. You're in infinity. Yeah. You do have the reflection in yourself where you got the, the pole, the, the spine in us, and then, you know, your Polaris would be the top of the head and those sort of things. Um, you know, the sun and moon and the two eyes in a sense. And so you do have this sort of um, internal pole that you can go to. And yeah. What I like is that, the uh, idea of Kundalini the stuff having it as an organizational principle for a society is cool, but then it's like an inversion when, in my opinion, you have like your, I'm not a fan of the idea of like needing to circle around the Kaaba and all that ritualistic stuff that kind of externalizes or, you know, the Martin Kenny thing of we got to go to the North pole in 2020 and activate our X-Men powers. And it's really important to recognize that you can be your own center and then on the idea of um, back to that astral travel thing I was talking about in my dream within a dream. I remember when I was studying long time ago, early in my occult research, one of the first places I started looking was into shamanism. And there was a technique. This is probably taught outside of shamanism. It's probably a mystery school thing, too. But the uh, technique was to create like an astral temple for yourself and you would practice your visionary and imaginary capacity and make a space that's unique to you that, you know, maybe you'd give it like four directions, maybe an altar in each direction. That's how I did it. Specific things on the altar. And so you'd practice going to that space in your mind during your shamanic journey work as like the launching point before you go somewhere else. So that part of like building up that practice through repetition of being able to like see within and go on those journeys, it's helpful to have like a, a specific place that you go. And then that also connects to the idea of memory castles, if you've heard of that, where people will actually design. So one of the techniques for that the ancients had for, I guess it was called memory palaces. The ancients had this technique for remembering large amounts of information, I think probably has something to do with how the bards were able to recite thousands of lines of epic poetry 
<laughs> off the top of their head, what you would do, and I've never tried this before, but you create something like what I'm describing, a space like a palace or a home that has rooms and you know they, they're connected to each other. You, there's a navigation through it and you put objects in the spaces that represent things that you want to be able to remember and access. And it makes a lot of sense as a technique because when we under, what we understand about memory, at least what I understand about it, is that it works through links. And the more things that you know that connect to each other, the more things that you can recall whenever one of those links is touched, right? I think that's kind of like <laughs> how we have these type of conversations right here. Yeah, that's brilliant. I learned a similar technique and it's very helpful. So I have a this temple basically that I go to. Um, so yeah, I, I love that. Yeah, it sort of reminds me of the concept of uh, information stacking or just the way our mind works through association. And I think, you know, um, we don't really get taught this very well in school how to associate things and and gabe shows how to you know basically in the way he sort of functions and a lot of this symbolic nature is actually bringing different ideas to get together through association and connecting them and i think that's an important technique that's sort of been lost um and in general say when, when i'm sort of working with the battery and all those sort of things um i'm looking for um correspondences constantly and that's how you can sort of pull in huge amounts of information and sort of layer it up. And that's what a lot of this symbology is. It's, it's really just um, information that's been stacked on one another. So it has moral sort of connotations. It has lawful connotations. Um, it has real world applications. And the other thing that's really important is um, there seems to be back in the day this sort of um, no separation between science, real science, and spirituality. In fact, if you're looking at real science, it should actually point you towards spirituality and vice versa. So and I think that's where we've sort of lost a lot of our, um, you know, gone downhill a bit in our society in a sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Go for I it, Gabe. I can riff a little bit on the uh, the mind castle concept. That was um, that was integral to the uh, the stories of Hannibal Lecter. And anybody who's read the books, you will go on a an interesting tour of the mind of Hannibal Lecter. In one aspect of his uh, mental prowess, is that he uses mind palaces uh, to store information. And that gives him the ability to actually go back to a specific day in his lifetime, go into a concert hall where he went to watch a show and actually pan through the audience and pick out a particular individual who was there at that show that day. And so one thing that is really interesting about that is that uh, they vilified it. They gave that characteristic to Hannibal Lecter as though to say anybody who is this intelligent is clearly, you know, the pinnacle of all evil. Yeah, you'd only use something like that as a nefarious serial killer cannibal, huh? Mm -hmm. When you think Great about, point. too, like my understanding of memory is that it's your, it's ether that stores memory. The yes. universal ether is the Akashic record of everything that ever happened. And then your ether in your personal bioplasmic bubble is where your memory is stored and circulates so you know it's a lot like water functionally and if it's just left unstructured maybe we're not tapping into some massive potential we have to structure our own internal ether and be able to have that level of recall like maybe that's actually when people are born they just have they're said to have photographic memory like oh they're just special maybe they're just somebody that in previous lifetimes really worked on that skill and carried it forward maybe unknowingly Nice. I like that theory a lot. I have um, read a, a memory book that goes through those sort of principles of the sort of palace or your, if you were going to give a speech, you would um, set out, you know, you would learn the layout of your own house or whatever it was. And then as you're walking around the house, you would um, implant ideas in certain spots. 
And so you all you would have to do is remember to visualize walking around your house and then all of a sudden you would remember um, parts of your speech and, and be and do it that way. So definitely these techniques do work because the people that were writing this book were able to memorize huge amounts of, um, you know, like a telephone book or whatever in short amounts of time just by being able to fit the the, the context or where the, the information needed to go. What if that had to do with the Abermelon ritual that Crowley set up at Loch Ness? Yeah, can you describe that in a little it, more summary? I wonder if he lit... So they say that the uh, castle was designed very specifically to accommodate aspects of the ritual. And I wonder... I didn't. I did catch that. Uh, I Lost wonder. Jones, the memory has to be located somewhere outside the brain. I fried mine. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well said. Well Thank said. you for doing that experiment for us. So, what if, as a safety precaution, if he was running this advanced ritual, but using the layout of the castle up there on Loch Ness to uh, sustain or maintain a pattern of some sort? Uh, just a theory, just a theory that maybe he, maybe Crowley was using a mind palace out of that castle. Just a thought. Yeah, um, this reminds me of um, a word that a friend uses all the time, and it's chords. And so according to somebody, according to source, according to an idea, things like that, you know. And when I think of the chord, I think of just like, you know, uh, this avenue to get from a to b wherever it is you know and when you're dealing with magic you're dealing with mercury hermes thoth you know and basically he is the one that goes over the bridge or goes up the world tree or up the pole you know to these different realms and what have you and so yeah i think you're totally right gabe i think that you know it's like whatever needs to be done to be corded to the right energy i suppose and to kind of get this download sort of thing and there's even uh, someone on Telegram posted some um, diagram of like a monk meditating. And there's all these symbols that are kind of like emanating from its head. And right at the very top, man, there's like the pole star and Ursa Major, you know. So it's making the connection that as you access your sacred center, you're accessing the sacred center, right? And therefore, uh, it's very much related to polar symbolism. Yeah, I like what Terry said. I was thinking the same thing, that the chord could be like a music chord where you're putting two notes together. Mm -hmm. And then also just the idea of Kabbalah. That is a cable phonetically. It's something that links one thing to another. That's great. Exactly. So when you were talking there, like um, about the mind palaces and things like that sort of come to mind, but the as I was explaining before, you've got the central pole and then the, the top of the dome or the top of your head is the, um, you know, you've got the Polaris and, and the actual stars and everything. So I'm just wondering if, if the Zodiac itself is a uh, mind palace. Once learned, then it's a, a communication device sort of thing or a, a way of storing knowledge between lots of people. I love that idea a lot. Yeah, man, exactly. And this gets into, once again, this book. And the guy was saying that, you know, it was kind of uh, part of some traditions to get the center point of town and then emanate 12 spokes, you know, from it. And then that makes uh, the different sections and that each of the sections symbolically was encoding, you know, something from uh, astrology, right? And then we have the 12 tribes of Israel and, and what have you. But I like that, dude. Mind palaces and the Zodiac. Yeah. And the other thing is like, then then you have all these rituals that you would do at certain times of year that would sort of refresh the memories or refresh where you are. Like the calendars uh, to me is so important as a, um, a way of, you know, integrating these memories or integrating these things to do at certain times, you know, whether it be farming or whatever activities. But um, you can see that there's like a in in the actions or the rituals that there's um, knowledge to be gained, you know. Yeah, for sure. That's one of the things I really actually just curious because you act you farm. You're a farmer, would you? Right, Elsie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, do you use astrology as a tool 
uh, in that regard with farming and, and seasonal stuff. You're in Australia though. So I, you know, I don't know if that messes yeah, everything it's all backwards. up. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does mess everything up. And so we're, we're backwards here, but the other thing, and, and it's been quite annoying to me because we've had, you know, our normal calendar, the Gregorian calendar is all over the place and it's not standardized. So, um, and the the days and things shift in it so you you sort of always feel like you're on quicksand but when you're dealing with like something like the 364 day calendar that's set to the stars then all of a sudden things get locked and that's what i've been working on um that you could say on on the fourth month on the second week on the saturday you could do that same process every year and it would it'd be on that exact same sort of um time and so as a mechanism for farming or something like that is is much um, more coherent because you you know exactly if it worked that year say you planted tomatoes it didn't work or whatever it did work really well you can actually do it on that exact same time without being sort of confused about where you are you know the other thing about the word cord i'm thinking about the word record and record you know that's <laughs> i don't know if everybody here caught my conversation with emily moyer but we got deep into the the record idea and the bizarre repetition of not just natural events and things that you would expect seasonally on like the exact day year after year but societal things and occurrences in one's personal life that if you're paying enough attention you know you're lucid enough in the dream of waking life that you'd start to notice that wait there's a time is not what we think it is it is it is a spinning record it's like a cd or a dvd on a spindle the akashic record maybe being uh somehow related to all of this you know i i think that's interesting um and then again we think of a record and it's like there's that central cosmic axis that everything revolves around you know that hub I've been thinking a lot about repetition lately. You know, it's uh, kind of bringing in like frequency, rhythm, and vibration aspects of the hermetic principles. Uh, like mantras type thing. Right, right. Because, yeah, it does. Repetition is uh, crucial to the programming, you know? Uh Hundred percent. Like for, uh, you know, as a drummer, you can you can actually start building in these. Right. Um, like w once when you learn a beat right at the start, you're like, oh, this is hard as hell. I have to use my brain so much to actually access what I'm doing. You know, keeping and then after it sort of sinks in as muscle memory and all that sort of stuff, you just like you could probably uh, read a book while you're doing it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I had a question for you, Lucas. Are you aren't you doing a uh, presentation for Templus Aquaria coming up? Yep, this Sunday. Yep. Will you give us a bit of a preview what that's going to be? Uh, I'm just going to be going through the sort of galvanic model and, um, you know, seeing the correlations with, say, um, some of the bio biology and um, free energy devices as well. So, um, yeah, just trying to bring it all together in sort of a coherent way, you know. I really want to I'm, – I'm planning on checking that out because I want to hear especially the part about the free energy devices. So – People, if they out there, if you want to hear or be there live for Lucas's course for Templus Aquaria, I'm going to drop a link for the temple. I recently did one myself there. Amazing stuff going on. We got Kalina in the chat, so thank you for putting that together. It's an awesome space. So much knowledge getting archived there, and uh, just going to keep growing. So maybe I'll see some people there. So your event chance uh, went over well when you did it just recently. Oh yeah, it was awesome. Uh, it was really cool to review the material. I, you know, I've read the um, biofield tuning books by Eileen before, but I re-listened to them this time in audiobook form to kind of refresh. And I picked up a lot of data that I didn't absorb the first time through that was fascinating. And I re, I put together a new form of. Um, presentation i've done in the past on the topic 
and it ended up being pretty dense. It was like two hours of me going through the slides and then probably like 45 minutes of Q and a, and then an hour or so of group healing modalities with the sound. It was badass. Uh, people can catch that at Templus Aquaria. And I also put it on my Patreon and Rockfin on the paid feed side. And I'm bring, I I just did a recording with Ben Fatherson for Odin's alchemy covering a lot of the same material, but a little more quickly paced without uh, as much detail in the presentation side, but also a lot of Ben's really great input on the subject. Yeah, I can attest it was, I was there. So it was a, uh, it was a really good show you put on and yeah, so many things sort of line up with other um, modalities as well. So yeah, it was great. Yeah, I'm really Very excited cool. to get to the part in Howdy's book about how the Egyptians used sound. Ooh. Yeah. Nice. It's That's going to be read. It's a fast read, like it's 500 pages, but I'm already 120 through it. it it's fun because you can like literally hear Howdy's voice when you read <laughs> the words. I love when an author has a, a clear way of speaking and you've heard them speak and then you read their text and it's like just them talking to you. It's awesome. So a topic I'm probably going to get cooking on my channel is going to be um, the Fasty calendar. I, I want to look at the nine-month calendar system with just a little more accuracy and just orient it onto our calendar, you know? And uh, something that I think brings that forward, potentially, is the story of Typhon. The Greek myth of Typhon marching across the land. In that time, the gods go into hiding in Egypt. And they take on the uh, form of approximately nine animals uh, in that story. And I think that that is encoding the, uh, the dynamic shift of the Zodiac down to a nine-month calendar and being preserved in the agricultural uh, climates of Egypt. Man, there's something there for sure. Like, how does it affect us to have our seasons divided into four with 12 months and those months are all oddly divided? And it's really, you know, if we're talking about the uh, Zodiac being a memory palace or a record that causes us to go through a particular loop year after year, would we have different experiences if we had a different record that we were playing? Much like a different shaped Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel, oh, yeah. right? there's your poll, Mario. Yep, no, exactly, for sure. And wasn't it, uh, did they have seven, or that's a ziggurat that has seven layers to it, or did the Tower of Babel have seven layers? Do you know, by chance, anyone? I'm sure there's probably different accounts of it, but I don't know off the top of my head. I do know, here's an interesting number. The Great Pyramid at Giza, the big one, has 201 steps, 201 levels, 201. Very interesting. interesting. Yeah, three. Yeah, makes me think of the world card, 21 at the very top. Oh, yeah, there you go. You know, there was, I don't even know, I think maybe it was actually in Secret Teachings of All Ages uh, by Manly P. Hall, right? Um, I could be mistaken on that, but I believe he said that where they derived the the letters for the Hebrew alphabet, which I've heard several stories about this. I don't know which one is true, you know, but that their capstone was like this crystal thing and that based on uh, the sun's position, it was shining light through the crystal and then it was creating this shadow just beneath and that they found 22 essentially different squiggles that they turned into the Hebrew alphabet, which I thought was kind of interesting. That is interesting. But again, yeah, and that sort of goes back to like 22. One, you know, the number 22 is, you know, you're 11, 11 or 11 plus 11. So, you know, you're getting that encoding again of the, you know, or if you break it down into 11 times 11, you get a 121 and you get the, again, that symbolism of the omphalos comes up 
So it's, it nearly always just returns to this mercurial idea of um, the uh, masculine and feminine coming together. So, right, right. Yeah, no, exactly. Hey, man. Uh, so since you're here with us, one of the things I get asked kind of regularly on social media is, hey, I live in the Southern Hemisphere. You're ignoring, uh, you know, our seasonal patterns and everything else. And so why don't you like come How up with dare some... you? <laughs> I know. Right. Uh, why don't you come up with some holistic system or like, why can't you explain both ways of doing things or whatever? And I never know what to say. And so you actually live being uh, in Australia, living there and very interested in astrology and a very smart guy. Like, what's your opinion about that? Or what, what's the correct response? Or even what's the next step for me to understand uh, what the correct response is? What do you think about that? I'm not sure if I've got the the right response, actually, like um, when I'm thinking about it, you know, it's just the seasons are totally reversed. So it's still going to be in Aries. It's still going to be in all those all the signs. But the actual meaning would would be sort of reversed from, um, you know, what Aries means to you guys, basically. So if you put it into farming perspective, I'm doing the exact opposite. To what you guys would be doing so when you're when you're in winter or i'm in summer so um how that sort of translates i'm not really sure what what you would do basically just in invert it um are there works dedicated to this by chance have you come across any southern no, hemisphere everything, astrology? everything seems to be northern hemisphere like everything it's like no one lived out here or what we're just fake <laughs> are you even real are you like some agent <laughs> yeah. i believe in are you, you just Luke. doing a voice <laughs> thanks thanks coming from the past yeah yeah, yeah this yeah is well that's that's it thing. like uh, uh, that, that's it like there's probably stories that say the the native australians have that would um you know explain their seasons using their own signs um i've definitely come across some stuff like that but really haven't gone into it deeply um because the you know the, the northern stuff there's way more information and it's sort of um seems to be uh way more fun <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure. So the four seasons reminds me of the four elements. And I have yet to check out your guys's Wizard of Oz podcast, Gabe. But did you make a correlation with the four main characters in the four elements by chance? Or uh, were you guys going down a different road, a, a different yellow brick road? Uh, that the first episode that we put out may not get released. It looks like uh, Homie Romy might have lost the uh some of the material so it might not come out uh but that's a great point i wish we had maybe put that on the table earlier i think it came up just a little bit towards the end but that's a great point that's a good starting point any conversation about wizard of oz should definitely have that the four elements uh also the kingdoms the uh alchemical kingdoms of plant animal and mineral you know, uh, those aspects, we were definitely coming at it from an alchemical perspective. And now uh, I'm looking forward to possibly uh, a part two uh, co collaboration coming up because I've got like a deeper grasp for what I want to communicate uh, uh, with that with that work. But yeah, look, uh, keep your ear to the ground. I think homie Romy and... Uh, uh, Kaylee and uh, Rachel and I might put put some something together soon. Nice, that'll be awesome. Yeah, uh, just for people who don't know, Cowardly Lion would be fire, right? And so, what's interesting to me is all of these characters, the uh, element that they correspond with, they're actually trying to reconnect with, right? Right. So the Cowardly yeah, Lion, yeah, yeah. he corresponds with fire, and he wants uh, his courage back, right? And so this is a matter of the will. And Leo corresponds with the heart as well, you know, right. and then uh, the Tin Man, he actually he gets rusted outside because of rain and he uh, he wants. No, he wants the heart. Right. Am I missed? I, I totally got that mixed up. 
or no. The lion wants courage, doesn't he? Yeah, lion wants courage. Right. Tin man wants the heart. That's watery. That's emotional. Yeah. You yeah. know. And then uh, the uh, straw man, he wants a brain. This has to do with air and and swords, right? So he's the he's symbolic of air. And then Dorothy, yeah. oh, mind. she's yeah. mind exactly. Yeah, Dorothy is symbolic of earth. And so even in the tarot, uh, like the princesses, uh, mm -hmm. they correspond with the earth, right? And so she's kind of like a motherly figure to Toto. So she's right. almost kind of like a young Mother Earth Gaia sort of thing in a way. So I think it's really fascinating to watch the movie through that lens. Yes. Not to derail this Wizard of Oz stuff, but I kind of want to back up to the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> so uh, Braden, Braden in our Rockfin side of the chat, he pointed out, or he asked the question, Lucas, is it true that Polaris is not visible in Australia? If so, is there another North Star or unmoving star? Now, I, I think this is a really good question because it's one of the things that flat earth refuters will point out and say that no flat earther will ever answer this question. And uh, the question being, why can't you see Polaris from the Southern Hemisphere or Sigma Octanus from the Northern can you see Polaris from, from down there, down under? Uh, well, I can't. No. You might be able to go up, froze. To, up the north and see it. Sure. Oh, now I can hear you. What okay. was that? Um, I can't see it. So, But you might be able to go up to the north um, and see it from there because that's more in the tropics anyway. It's a big place, Australia. So, Do you have a conceptualization yeah, of why it would be out of sight on a on a flat plane well you're too far away you just can't you know that's just a um, perspective thing that's kind of how i thought about it too yeah it's like a big room you know you walk to one end and you you can't see the other side you know i'm, I'm with you on that okay so <laughs> while i'm on this like questions for flat earthers that refuters will put forward and I've got Lucas here is really deep into it. Uh, this comes from David Whitehead's new Telegram channel called Flat Earth Refuted, where he just like makes fun of flat earthers. It's kind of a little mean. <laughs> and not all of it seems to be like legitimate criticism, but some of it is worthy questions that I would like to know uh, someone's thoughts about too. So he says, why do stars appear to rotate counterclockwise around the northern, the North Pole and clockwise around the southern is that the case i haven't looked at i have personally not observed the stars from both places to know um yeah well i've only seen them the way that i've seen them so you know they just seem to be going well, what would it be i suppose it's uh counterclockwise wouldn't we be able to figure this one out just by getting like some kind of app where you can put a location in and then look at the stars and then another location and then look at another somebody, somebody do that experiment for us. I'll you know, it's the... a bit hard to refute the, the flat earth when you just like looking up at the stars and things like that. These are all things that are, you know, you're dealing with perspective. You're dealing with so many different sort of attributes that we really can't, um, we don't know about. So I don't know, but when you look at the stuff that we do know about, you know, water lays level, all those sort of things, see too far, it's, it's pretty easy. But um, you, you can't use the the these sky things as uh, representative of, you know, proving the, the globe or whatever it is. It's just, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's true. I mean, just because you have a question that is difficult to answer, doesn't necessarily mean that this other theory is the true theory, you know, N nobody, nobody on either side of the feds has actually been to space or has been high enough up to high up enough to know either way. I just usually just fall back on the whole, uh, there's no curvature that I can measure whenever I'm somewhere high up and I can see a faraway landmark that I know exactly how far away it is. Well, I think the best one is actually, you know, having a vacuum next to a pressurized system without a boundary. I mean, that from that law there, 
basically means um, space can't exist as, as the way that they describe it. It's very, um, it's very simple. So it just, everything they've done, it it's, it's flat out proves them as liars and everything that they've done from there on is no longer trustworthy. So then you just come back to the same thing with, you know, water's level and then you can see too far. So that, that tells you what you want to know there. It's really, it is really simplistic when you, when you get down to the, um, you know, the root of it. Have you guys all seen the sky stone? It is a, uh, apparently there's only a couple of them. Um, it's a, uh, blue stone that they have tested and it turns out the stone itself is an incredibly high percentage of oxygen content. Uh, I believe they say 80% oxygen, which my brain just fizzles out and falls falls to mush as soon as they say that it's an 80% oxygen stone. But the theory behind that stone is that it would be the firmament. It's like a chunk off of the firmament, which if somebody could prove that to me, then uh, I'd be 80% more into the flat earth perspective. <laughs> but the sky stone is fascinating. I like that one a lot. I'm going to have to look into that. That means that there's two different stones that claim to be from the firmament. Because I know there's another one as well, and it's uh, I can't remember the what they call it, but it's something glass, yes. and that's the same idea, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I say basically, and it's it's still a hypothesis, obviously, but that um, the dome is created by a lack of uh, temperature by the sun not being there, in a sense. So the That's further the away you get stone. from the sun, you, it gets colder, and then you basically get um, solid oxygen or solid air, and that crystallizes into a form that's um, hard. It's also superconductivity and all those sort of things come into play. Right. But it's, um, you know, it, it's just a natural. It doesn't have to be sort of formed by some miracle. It's just really temperature. What so. if that was the Han Blue? What if that's where that that paint that drops out of three-dimensional space and into two-dimensional space, what if Han Blue is actually sky stone powder? Huh. That, that would be a total effing trip. I'm not familiar with that blue. Oh, Han Blue is the paint that is on the Terracotta Warriors. And they've harvested it uh, through very specific, delicate means and taken it to a laboratory where they applied um, uh, extreme low temperatures, extreme low temperatures, um, and like using laser beams, <laughs> extreme. And they gave it a, a high magnetic field. And when they did those two things, it dropped out of the third dimension in the, into second dimensional space. And so there is, the, and this is just my imagination, taking two things that are very rare, extremely rare, um, also blue, and have to do with space and dimensional uh, interfacing. And so if Hans Blue has anything to do with the Sky Stone, that would be completely mind flipping <laughs> nice dude. just saying that's interesting there's something going on with painting soldiers blue and i don't know exactly what the deal is but i've seen it several times and it makes me think of un troops um and so they're they're notoriously they wear blue like helmets and stuff like that you know so there must be some old ancient correspondence there with doing that <laughs> they wouldn't do that to that many soldiers for no reason, you know? Yes, they just come come in out of the blue, as they say, out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Snakes got me all flustered. 
<laughs> the, there's been a lot of comments about your appearance. I think people are objectifying you, Gabriel. They want to see your hat off. That's what they were saying at the beginning. Oh, there it is. Oh, <laughs> nice tease. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, so Mario, what have you dropped recently on your channel? Anything that might lead us into further exploration? I'd also love it if we got some uh, questions from the pan for our panel from our chatters too. That'd be cool. Maybe like do a little Q and A. Yeah. Um, so I'm researching Taurus right now because that's what I do. And so I recently released kind of a quick correspondence video regarding the major myths that involve bull and cow symbolism. So you've got, you know, the Minotaur, the golden calf, it just, there's so many different examples. It really goes like on and on. And so I kind of just chose uh, a few that I thought were worth sharing with people. And, you know, actually one of the things that kind of, you know, it's this, it's a tangent, you know, and it's a whole rabbit hole, but this idea of, and I don't know how many people out there care about this, but there is like a fundamentalist faction of uh, Zionist folks that are looking for a red heifer. And they've been doing this for like years and years and years. They want to find like a pure red heifer. And if it has one hair that doesn't match the rest of it, it's no bueno, you know. And so they believe that once this red heifer is found, then they're going to sacrifice it and then they're going to take the ashes. And I believe they're somehow going to purify the Temple Mount and then Jews will be able to go there. And I just learned while researching this and other things that part of the whole story of the golden calf in the Bible was that they uh, ground up the golden calf and they put the dust into the river and then they had people drink from the river. So I just find this really interesting parallel between <laughs> the golden calf grinding it up to dust and then putting it in the river and then having uh, the acolytes drink it. And then now this search for the red heifer and then wanting to burn it and then sprinkle its ash, you know, um, on the temple mount. And one of the things they're trying to do, too, is create the third temple. And uh, with that, they want to and I didn't know this until very recently, but they want to bring back animal sacrifice. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. And it's it's remarkable how that agenda rides on uh, certain events as they roll out uh, politically and in the, in the, it legally also. Um, but somebody says, <laughs> uh, somebody has made a really good point about the uh, Tuskegee experimentation and how when the Tuskegee experimentation was coming to the surface and being revealed in as a court case, um, it was laying a path. It was uh, kind of feeling out the boundaries for what will be acceptable for, for the public to accept in tr as far as human experiments will go. And whatever we will allow for human experiments, it is also blazing our tolerance for animal experimentation at the same time. It's like an unspoken truth to, if we'll do it to uh, humans, then uh, our acceptance level for animal experimentation is correspondent to it. It's, yeah, it's well, I've specific. always saw it as very similar. That there's a gradient. Um, between what you will do to animals and then what you will do to people and as you as the depravity happens towards animals and so does there uh, is uh, worse and worse depravity that happens towards humans so you know i've seen that they're sort of karmically bound um so yeah that's just my views anyway so uh one of the members in my telegram for interverse chrysalis she's an australian as well and she went to, I probably could read the, the message and see where this was at. I'll, I'll tell you after I show it, but she was in an art museum and there was a lot of creepy stuff at that art museum. 
lots, but here's a bull that she saw that's hanging, a bull sculpture hanging by its back legs. Oh. Yeah, that's this is where the term bloodbath comes from. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, there is so much sacrificial symbolism baked in. Okay, into that was in both. Adelaide. Is uh, Adelaide pretty creepy there, Lucas? No, not usually, but yeah, I had a look at those pictures and that was some pretty weird stuff. The, the oh, while I'm showing her stuff. pictures, uh, here's uh, humans as pin cushions. Oh, lovely. Yeah, there you go. That's what they want for us. twins, Gemini. Good point. Very good point. Yeah, right? Taurus, Gemini. Right. Nice pun, though, with the good point there, Gabe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it also, it's a bad point. Yeah, it has a... It, it almost had to be Gemini twins because of the voodoo. The nature of the voodoo doll is that it's a simulacrum of, of the target. So it kind of yeah, had yeah. to be twins. It's kind of interesting too how she sent a pick the uh clip of a bull and then the twins, you know, in going order from Taurus to Gemini in perfect order. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But uh yeah, there's this interesting sacrificial thing with both Aries and Taurus that are very, very strong. So I've talked about uh Moloch or Baal, you know, on my Instagram and stuff recently. And I think it's curious that this is the beginning of spring, you know, and that uh, we, you think of abundance and life and things thriving in the sun and everything else. But then on an esoteric level, when you look into a lot of these myths, you know, uh, the ram was sacrificed, you know, and that was a whole big thing. Same thing with the bull and, and what have you. And there's still just remnants of all this stuff that exists out there, which I'm fascinated with. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I've brought up the perspective, you know, with the using the Trinity in a sense to calculate where you are in the season. So you would have the sidereal, then you would have that um, the sign that goes before the sun at sun, um, before sunrise, and then the one that goes down after the sun. So that would be the the dying sign, the westing sign. So this is the correlation I've made that there's the sacrifice. Um, is that sign that's just about to die um, and goes down into the West. Oh, sure. That makes sense. The necessary sacrifice for things to continue and perpetuate. Yeah, but it's interesting too when you when you do it, say if you're looking at cancer and things like that, when it actually dies is, and it's a water sign, right? So it's dying in the, the heart of summer. So you're getting these sort of correlations that water goes to die in summer. And then it comes back to life in a couple of months and sort of refreshes. So there's these ideas that are sort of, you know, I, I don't truly understand it 100% myself, but, um, and I'd need to spend a bit more time with it. But um, generally, I think there's a correlation there between what things are dying at certain times um, of the year to um, allow for others to sort of live in a sense and creating that seasonal fluctuation. Sure. That makes sense. You know, also too, just thinking about this stuff, it makes me wonder, you know, I looked into these photos of, of Moloch and people are like giving their firstborn child to this bull God, you know, and it's like, are, are we getting the straight story here? I'm inclined to think, no, you know, um, is human sacrifice, is that radically over-exaggerated, is it underplayed? You know, I just have all of these different questions. I, I know what the, like, mainstream history says, but it makes me wonder, that would be a perfect psyop or agenda, you know, to put that on these people that maybe never did it. Yeah, and the other thing, I, I just, was it more, more metaphorical? I just think it's nearly all metaphorical and basically, you know, you, it's the the sign or whatever that's going into the sacred fire. It's going into the sun. So when you put it in that perspective, it just, I don't know. I think people take these metaphorical, what was known back in the, in the day and then try to do a literal sort of representation of it. And it's, it's not how it's meant to be. So, I, I recently watched your uh, video, Mario, on symbolic studies about about the cow. Okay. This, you know, the sacrificial animal. 
Um, and uh, a whole lot of things are like going to be, you know, the theme for the next, you know, for this, this next run through a couple more weeks, I think that we're in Taurus. Um, yeah. So uh, I think of that constellation that you pointed out, Auriga, a lot. It uh, Auriga is the charioteer. Uh, he's a, a, a demigod who was born with like serpentine legs, slithery legs, and he's carrying a goat with him in his chariot. And this little goat, its name is Capilla. It's like a, a little baby goat, and it's like hanging out on his shoulder while he uh, rides around, uh, kind of going over the horns of the bull. Um, but I think that that has powerful uh, relationship with Mithra in the idea of Mithra jumping over, having victory over the bull, you know, because a, because a, a, a chariot needs animals to pull it, theoretically. Uh, so in the charioteer is often depicted with bulls pulling his chariot, but he is a pentagram in shape. He's pentagonal in shape. He has a goat on his shoulder. And I've brought this up in the past, but Auriga is a pentagram with a goat inside of it. It's a very satanic uh, couple of ingredients. You know, there, there could be a case made uh, to say that Auriga is a satanic constellation. I'm just pointing that out. I'm not saying it's evil or bad. I'm just saying it has the ingredients um, involved in it. Um, but it's also Taurus is the fifth month, right? Is it, am I correct? It is if you're going on the Roman. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. I mean, May, May. May is Taurus or Gemini. So okay. yeah. it starts as Taurus. So there's a, I'm just pointing out that it has that five, that aspect of the five. Nice. Yeah. Um, which uh, we're talking about sacrificial animals, a sacrificial goat is a is a sacrificial animal it's inside of a five-sided shape the pentagram it makes me think of a house uh because uh, your standard house is a pentagram it's got the the pyramid at the top and then the two walls in the bottom is a pentagram um and then the lily flower i believe it, the may flower is the lily as well so uh all of these uh all tie into that uh, synchronistically to the number five in the correspondence uh, to all things five related. Yeah, I see where you're going. Uh, you know, even uh, the Hierophant card, which corresponds with Taurus, is the fifth card, right? Great point. And then also, um, which is Roman numeral V. And when you look at the Taurus constellation, you see this gigantic V in the sky. That's kind of its most prominent feature is this V. And so I actually did a presentation years ago tying all sorts of V symbolism with bull symbolism. And there's a surprising amount of overlap, really, once you start looking into it. It's very, very interesting. But yeah, I definitely see what you're saying there. Nice. This brings up an interesting uh, pairing of letters that I've been thinking about. And it's just like, I can't not think about it, but A-U. Because that's how you spell Auriga, right? A-U-R-I-G-A. You got it. A and that, astronomical unit of gold, A-U. Yes, exactly. And then uh, Lucas is in Australia, A-U. <laughs> nice. And then you've got Taurus, which is very much related to Tau, which is T-A-U. And then that makes me think of the golden calf going back to the gold AU. So I don't know if you guys have any insights or even people in the chat regarding AU, but I'm just starting to notice it everywhere. This doesn't quite tie into AU, but I was looking at some, I was trying to like see if I could find any quick, interesting information <laughs> that needs further study for sure on the Southern hemisphere mythology. So I'm like, okay, let's go to the, Let's go to the Aboriginal version of astronomy or astrology, if there's any info on that. And I was kind of skimming through it. And on the subject of Taurus or the bull, you know, the the Pleiades, the seven stars of the Pleiades are part of that constellation, right? 
And I guess, according to this information I found, the uh, aboriginals also called them the Seven Sisters. So there's like some kind of very ancient root to that particular symbolism. Nice. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, just getting back to the gold and um, the bull, um, the only thing I could think of was basically um, you have Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva in the, the Hindu, which is um, the Trinity, basically. And, and when when I sort of put it together, I thought Brahma is the sun, Shiva the moon, and Vishnu, Mercury, that Mercury character. So Brahma is a type of bull, obviously. And then it then that also goes back you know, connects to Abraham and those sort of things. So, um, again, you're sort of dealing with that polarity sort of side of things and the bull representing um, more the, the sun. And in actual fact, when you do the um, look at the the stars rising at the, the height of summer, the rising sign is Taurus. Um, so that that is the height of summer. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Interesting. Yeah, to do with the summer solstice. Okay, so one of the things while doing my bull research, Taurus research, is that they say that Taurus was once the first sign of of the astrological year, and so that's why it was held in such high prominence that it was like the golden sun, right? The golden calf. It was basically like a uh, Christ-like figure, uh, kind of like a king sort of thing, right? And there's remnants of this all over the place. So, Lucas, since you're skeptical of uh, processional shifts, does that mean that the signs have never changed either? Like the order of the signs of what comes first during spring and, and the various seasons and whatnot? Or do you think that that is the case, that some of these signs have shifted? No, I think that it, they've fairly well held true to the order of everything it's just maybe the way we're looking at it and that's what i was um more interested in because you do so much research about these different um signs and stuff like that and you, you really just can't go and say well that's a load of rubbish and throw things out and start your own um again you know so what i did was um worked out a way where i could try and integrate it all and um, still have it be a part of a, a, a working system. And so, and that's the best I could come up with. And it seems to have these correlations, especially when you um, have, say, three signs put together um, or, or multiple signs put together, you actually form um, mythological creatures because a lot of mythological creatures are um, crossed over signs in a certain way. And so I was finding ones where it would be like um, a, a horse and a, um, oh, what was it? Uh, I'll have to find it for you, but it was basically just this mythological character and it was a, a visual representation of January. And it was three sort of signs put together and joined up. So I think there's just a lot to learn with how to to um, really break apart these mythological characters and and see where you are where it points you to in the in the zodiac yeah i just put out a video today about this subject uh in uh, a, a word that i'm trying i'm bringing to the forefront is uh propinquity and that is that <clears throat> when things are in proximity to one another they have a relationship and one thing that I did in my video was um, I took the constellation of Leo, the lion, and its proximity, its propinquity to Hydra, the, the serpent constellation right next to it. And when you combine them, like a Visica Pisces, you know, you take Leo, you take Hydra, and you blend them together, and the blending of those two things gives you the Yaldabaoth the lion-headed serpent god. Um, so, yeah, that's that's something that I find very rewarding to use propinquity to de-occult these characters. Yeah, that's a great one, man. 
And so even uh, in the Egyptian Dendera Zodiac, they show Leo riding a boat. And depending on the illustration you're looking at, that boat is actually a serpent. Right. A snake, you know? a cat on a snake's back. Yep, yep. And a lot of times, too, or at least with this Zodiac, there's a woman holding the tail of the lion. And so, in my opinion, this is the story of Virgo, Leo, and Hydra. Excellent. 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 I love that. You know, one thing I was thinking of back on the idea of Taurus and the, like the, why we have months the way we do is that we know that the Gemini season is mercury's season or hermes right and in mythology the mother of hermes is maya or maya so with the the mother venus taurus month of may being called maya I find that kind of interesting nice that's great and i think that lines up it's some it it's the my son yeah yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, right. Nice. And then that being or you know your thought, your Hermes, your Mercury could be seen as your Masonic great architect too. It definitely relates to that theory we've been tossing around that the Masons are earth. They're brick Masons. They're stone Masons and Taurus is that earth element. It's really interesting, actually. There's a lot of Gemini symbolism with masonry. And so a lot of hero twins are credited for being like the founders of certain cities and stuff, including Rome. And so uh, Romulus and Remus, the hero twins, one's kind of good, one's kind of evil sort of thing. One ends up killing the other, but they're credited for building the first wall out of masonry. And if you go to Terminus. any... Uh, Herminus, yeah. And when Terminus, you to... I'm just thinking of Terminus because that was in the beginning of the weave. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. exactly, for sure. And so if you go to any Freemasonic lodge, you're going to see these two pillars. You know, when I see Freemasonic symbolism, a lot of times I'm like, oh my God, is this like Gemini encoded? Because you have the Gemini twins right there, the symbol for yeah. Gemini, Roman numeral yeah. two, you know? And uh, one of the reasons why they're associated with bricks, by the way, I have this great book, I've mentioned it before, Babylonian star lore. This guy is awesome, Gavin White. And he basically said that the Babylonians started resuming construction works and started resuming uh, baking bricks outside because the weather was favorable. So uh, the time of Gemini, according to the Babylonians, was once known as the brick mold. Okay. And so there's this very interesting Gemini brick thing going on which is why in a lot of older sun cards too you'll see two children in front of a brick wall Castor. well i wanted to Eagle. okay so this makes me want to just go ahead and point out the whole placenta of it all <laughs> for gabriel yes all brilliant. right because but the story of the zodiac you get the twins are born right and then cancer happens the cut well the cut could be the sacrifice of one killing the other in a sense, because the the child that's born comes out dual after they're born. There's a, you know, they've got their baggage, their placenta, if you will. And in the mythologies throughout the world, it is just replete this twin symbolism where one kills the other or one is sacrificed and one is banished. So I think that that's part of the idea of we have Cain and Abel, you know, Cain kills Abel and then Cain is banished. Right. So it's kind of like if you don't properly uh work with your divine twin or you're in some way in some way like um dishonor that then you're banished from the garden of eden or from paradise you have isaac and esau like obviously we already brought up romulus and remus but there's probably a bazillion more examples that we could point out and i think that might be one of the bigger secret or occulted things that's encoded there right it, we, we, we've got uh, Castor and Paul Ox. Paul Ox. Ox is a bull. Castor would be the crafty one. The Cain would definitely be Castor. Uh, and Abel would be Paul Ox. Um, that is right. And back to that artificer idea, yes. or trickster idea, you know, Cain is the, Cain was the smith. 
right? And let's not miss our opportunity to point out uh, placenta is the P in the C. Placenta, that's Pollux and Castor, P in the C. Very interesting. Very interesting. I think we're talking. We're dealing with the C to the CP, the cap, the sacrificial goat <laughs> for sure. And in the Vedic mythology, there's the there's Yama and Yami, who are the twin siblings who later become husband and wife. So maybe that's like uh, an an earlier idea before they were sort of encoding the archetypal necessity of this separation or this uh, pollution, Pollux. That's interesting, man. Well, that, the, that, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, usually the, the twins have the two horses with them right. um, on either side because they're, right. they're horse masters. Yes. Now, when, when you said that, that they be, become one, well, the opposite to them is Sagittarius, which is a man and a horse. So the, the, they join together those two sort of wow. symbols into the, the one thing. Wow. And then, now we're talking about... <laughs> Now we're talking about too, like the crucifixion of your the, your twin from you, which is the removal of it from you, and the crucifixion happens on Cal Calvary, which is an anagram for cavalry, which is what yeah, the warriors and, on and horseback are the the twins on horses. Yeah, so those two points is where it basically crosses over the Milky Way, um, or your river Styx, or um, also goes to die in a sense. At either side, and it's got that uh, nice. ox, oxes, ford the river. Yep, pull, pull ox, pull ox. Yeah, for sure. Pull. And chance, what you said about um, the siblings or twins or whatever getting married, the lovers card is ruled by Gemini, and it's all yeah, about the alchemical marriage. That symbolism comes from an earlier time. That's maybe before the Romanization, if you will, before the takeover of the hierarchy by the <laughs> the Ophiolatry cult. Yeah, I think so anyway, because it is sort of a divine marriage to uh, honor your <clears throat> holy guardian angel. Like I have this whole theory. I've talked about it before. Maybe it's been a while, but the, the placenta actually as a living being has a spirit a spiritual essence, a life force to it, and a consciousness just like you do, just like anything that is um, organic, or <clears throat> maybe doesn't even need, everything's organic, really, if you think about it, because it all comes from comes from the ether, comes from life force energy, which is ether crist crystallizes into matter. So I think that part of this ritual of the birth that is done now, where it's cut off and it dies without being able to merge its essence into the baby and then like the materials are thrown away or actually they're sold to cosmetic companies and weird pharmaceutical companies and things like that that um that's a dishonoring and maybe even a traumatizing of that the spirit of your divine twin and what could have been an angel on your shoulder becomes maybe a devil on your shoulder because you have this almost like quantum entanglement connection to a traumatized spirit that shares your exact DNA, 100%. And it, so, I mean, I don't know how you could be more entangled with something than that. But I feel like at the point in my life where I made this realization and then like made peace with that and like cleared the energy of that and like honored that other being that is also me because it has, it shares my DNA exactly. I've noticed a lot more. I mean, this is subjective as it can be, but I've noticed a lot more spiritual assistance from unseen forces guiding me on my way. That's beautiful, man. I I wasn't here when you guys, I think we're talking a lot about the placenta symbolism, but I've been picking it up over the last handful of months and you guys are spot on. It's You'll find that episode in the archive from last year. I think it was in October, me and Gabriel and Cheney. It's another funny, it's another apocalypse pun in the title. It was placenta apocalypse. <laughs> Because nice, it was nice. on, we did it on Eclipse, I think. You know what? We're coming up on nine months away. Whoa. Nine months since the placenta apocalypse. Okay, that I better dig really, up a link to that episode. It's a really good one. That is really meaningful. Yeah, man. 
the the placenta thing it's the gift that keeps on giving you you, you know it's like it it is literally luggage uh you know equipaje your equipment um and it's beautiful how um sometimes you you bring gifts with you you know into this life uh and sometimes you you bring burdens uh with you depending on that relationship for sure but it's just beautiful how uh uh metaphorical and literal it is so since we've been talking about gemini a little bit um i know in private i've talked to some people about this but have i ever discussed the gemini ritual that was the george floyd incident a little bit but i'm down for more i'm always down for more because that's a good that's a good topic right so the george floyd situation i'll call it happened during gemini right and so as i mentioned there's a lot of freemasonic um twin symbolism going on you know they even call each other brothers and i think of uh these hero twins right and so there's the babylon connection that i just shared with the bricks and everything the twin pillars hermes mercury even the g the the freemasonic g you know i think it ultimately means seven but for a brief period in time i thought that it could potentially also mean gemini you know romulus and remus being the hero twins that built the first wall of rome the two kids on the sun card with the brick wall behind them that's to me that's the big decode is that it's a babylonian reference to brick making and therefore gemini right well george floyd that whole situation happened during gemini and i started noticing um as the news was coming out about it that there was a guy named stephen jackson who was an nba player and he kept on saying uh george was like a twin to me we were brothers we were like twins and i'm like this guy's like really overemphasizing this twin thing i'm like what is going on here and then i found out that george floyd was from these projects that he called the bricks i found a photo of him wearing a hat and underneath the bill somebody customized it and it said brick boys right on it right and i was i thought that was very interesting for all of these reasons that i already discussed um minneapolis is a twin city to saint paul and the whole event happened in minneapolis right yeah. and by the way with the stephen jackson thing he would have been the good twin because he was an nba player and then george floyd would have been the evil bad twin right well the big big kicker is that when people started protesting there were pallets of bricks being found in major cities across the United States. And these bricks were used to destroy the city. And you so know what's happening right now in Minneapolis, <laughs> in Minneapolis right now, there's huge riots for people wanting to like have their right to have unrestricted baby murdering. I mean, abortion, which is exactly what it is when this whole like placenta cult uh, birth birth wow. sorcery thing is an abortion it's an abortion of a part of of the delivery so, so weird the, that's the happening bricks, right now the bricks are freemasonry yeah it's, it's free, free literally freemasonry masonry yeah exactly we're, we're exactly. in the sign of taurus the earth sign it's just too on point that that's that's cooking up right now Yep. And George Floyd, his father was a Freemason. And so there's photos of him in the whole regalia and, and everything else. So to me, it was, it's a pretty clear and obvious Gemini oh, ritual. Right. And you pointed this out before. This is this was you, Mario, but the lovers dynamic of Gemini. And there's rumors that he was a porn star. And so even right down to the porn star mythology, whether that's true or not, it's amazingly consistent with the zodiacal signs and symbols. Oh, check out this comment. And, and Nua, also read to... as Nugua, is the mother of God, mother goddess of Chinese mythology, credited with creating humanity and repairing the pillar of heaven. There you go, nice. Mario. Dude, that's Here's cool. Pillar. Thank you for sharing. And if you're taking Gemini to mean like the um, Cain and Abel, then you know, uh, doesn't Cain kill Abel or one of the you know, vice yeah, yeah. versa? And so that that was exactly what 
you know, was portrayed on the, the George Floyd sort of stuff. So, yep, exactly. And a lot of people symbolically, when you think of number of two and you think of two people, the, the first reaction I used to have is that, oh, it's two people coming together. It's a union sort of thing. But when you look up the symbology of number two, it's actually very divisive as well, because it means that the one is split right into two. So there's that. There's this total uh, divisive black and white sort of quality to the number two as well. Yeah, see, I think that's part of the linguistic sorcery that's been cast on humanity. Not just linguistic, but numer numerological uh, degradation as well. Like, at the point when humanity dropped all mystical knowledge or association with number and began to just look at them as purely cold digits, you know, lifeless digits that are just there for, like, trading or counting beans or whatever, I think that is the point as well when the idea of division actually entered into the equation. I mean, yes, you can divide something in two, like I could cut a loaf of bread in two, but in, in life and in things that occur in nature, nature doesn't actually ever divide. It only multiplies. So even in the idea of like cellular mitosis, they'll tell you the cells dividing, but actually it's two whole cells are being created. It's not really dividing, if that makes sense. So this idea yeah. of gemation, which is part of the root for where we get Gemini in the first place, is um, mythologically, I think we were meant to understand that this was nature's fractal multiplication of itself. But instead, we've had it replaced. Instead of there being twin lovers, we have, you know, war warrior horsemen and brothers that kill each other. And so one killing the other is definitely now we're dividing. We have less than we had before, which is the inversion of things. And then back to that idea of the G for Freemasonry. Now, there's a lot of possibilities, but I always liked the idea that it symbol symbolized maybe as one of the things that the generative principle itself, you know, that Gemini and their, their uh, Cain, <laughs> their God Cain, if you will, two ball Cain. But Tessarion says that the G represents the Gionum. And the Gionum were, that was the title given to the heads of the uh, Jewish academies in Babylon in the like 11th century somewhere. And we know that, you know, it's said that free, all Freemasons are Jews and not like as a nationality or religion, but in a mystical sense. Very interesting. Uh, regarding the two and the splitting and dividing and, and stuff, uh, I don't know if you feel the same way or if I should use the word multiplication, but you know, we are taught this thing about numbers uh, kind of all just uh, being external from each other. Right. And not, there's no unified sort of concept there, but you know, in my opinion, honestly, it's like, there's only one, one there, there is no other one. So there is no external one outside of the one. And that literally, I think that maybe what we're dealing with mathematically is that all of the numbers that exist that we use are actually uh, divisible from that one. So that, that when you have two, it is the one split in two. And then when you have three, it's just three parts of the one and four is just four parts of the one. Does that make sense? That's that's a hundred percent. It's numbers are basically relationships. Um, and then you can see those relationships in form and that's geometry. But you you have that unity, and then you have the duality, and then from that um, becomes the harmony. So the, you got the one, two, and three. So, yeah, I think you're spot on with the, that understanding of, and, and that sort of brings us back to the point about you know when we we're talking about Egypt and they didn't really have this, um, this you know believe in all these different gods, um, and it's it's similar to Buddhism where you sort of don't really talk about the the overarching creator because it's undescribable and i, I would suggest that say um those the Tao that can be named is not the Tao. it goes in Taoism too yeah, yeah exactly so that's your unified sort of um and so we come into a world unified in in our progression as children and then start to polarize and become sort of of two minds in a sense understand things and then we're supposed to come back into a uh, a type of harmony and um 
you know, bring those things together, bring the sun and the moon together into that sort of um, mercurial understanding, being in the center, do you know? Yeah, exactly. And you now, said what you said about the one, two, and three Go for is it. super relevant because numbers do have this property where after the third digit, it returns to one. If you take one, two, three, and four, you add them all together, it equals 10, which reduces to one. And the same thing happens if you add all the digits between one and seven. And then obviously three numbers later, you have 10, which is a one. And 13, same thing happens. And it goes on forever that way. So number is really like repeating cycles of Trinity in a sense that keep returning to one. So it may be that three is the one, two, and three are kind of like the only numbers that exist on a spiritual metaphysical level that everything is generated out of that, like mother, father, child dynamic or archetype, which is interesting when you look at selfeggio tones, because the selfeggio frequencies, uh, they add up each of the individual frequencies. If you take the, di the digits in them, they add up and reduce to three and all, all the selfeggio tones, the difference between any two that are next to each other in sequence is one, one, one. So like your five, two, eight Hertz and a four, one, seven Hertz, the difference is one, one, one. And it goes across the whole scale from uh, one to nine that way. You know, I look at it as well as, as it basically represents a gradient, doesn't it? Or a magnet. Um, in, in a sense, you just have two poles and then, the, then you have that center point where they sort of cancel each other out, which would be, you know, that uh, mercurial point. But from everything, we can sort of um, view the world through this uh, magnet idea or this trinity idea because it is really just how energy moves. You have a low-pressure system, a high-pressure system. They're going to start to move towards each other, um, you know, cold and hot, all those sort of things. Um, it's just the polarity at play and that, that movement between them. Yeah, right. And so I'm glad you said polarity and you said polarize just a minute ago. And so when I think of the one, I think of the pole, right? It, it's, that's what you're drawing when you're drawing number one. It's the pole. OK. And so when I was looking into the book that I'm, I'm reading, you know, and I'm thinking about uh, taking over these cosmic access points for these various um, cultures and communities, you know, I'm like, OK, so if that's what's going on in like Jerusalem right now and they're always going to be fighting over these spots, you know, is that why we call it politics, politics? You know, is that you're fighting over the pole? It's the king of the mountain sort of idea of taking yes. over that axis mundi point that people have planted, you know, their uh, flag into the ground or whatever. Politics. I thought it was because it's multiple parasites, politics. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that, yeah. too. That's true. Also I've, makes sense. I, I've also been looking at the uh, the concept of it's yes and Mario <laughs> of polydactyl uh, having an extra digit, and that has definitely been on my mind a lot lately um, uh, because it is very similar to the word politics. A politician and polydactyl they look strangely similar, but also it implies that they are using a different standard of measure. The fact that they would have 11 digits instead of 10, you know, it's like they, if they take a handful, their handful is more than our handful. Sort of reminds me of the princess bride, you know, looking for the six fingered man. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Exactly. Very, very interesting. So, uh, Gabe, you just released a video about Moon Knight, right? Yeah, just a, li just a little. Just oh, a you little gotta save piece. it. Save it for marvelous demystifiers. <laughs> I'm trying. I can't wait. I'll watch. I'm definitely excited to see what you put out on that. Yeah, it's really hard to keep it in because it's like there's so much presenting itself all at once. I just had to get my thoughts put into a stream of consciousness to share. Let me interject before you say anything else about that, because I, I got Howdy to watch it. <laughs> and he uh, he's put out a, at least two videos on it now, and I've only seen the first one, but he made some really, really keen observations right off the bat that 
at the beginning of the series, this isn't really a spoiler, but the main character works in the in a museum in London, an Egyptian museum. And he's like, you know, unboxing merchandise to distribute throughout the building or whatever. And he sees a poster of the Aeneid. And he points out that there were supposed to be nine gods on the poster. And uh, his boss was like, I don't care. This is what Howdy pointed out. His boss is like, oh, I don't care about that. It doesn't need to be right. And what's interesting is not only was the show admitting that they're going to be telling you things that are incorrect about Egyptian mythology and Egypt in general, but beyond that, there were there was at least one god depicted on that poster that is not part of the Aeneid anyway. So there's, there's like a, a right at the beginning of the show, they're telling you we're about to uh, flood the collective consciousness with even more incorrect information about Egypt. And this is what most people are going to base what they even think Egypt was on, on this, especially younger, newer generations. You know, this is going to influence the way they see this particular mythos forever. Yes. And uh, I think that the part of what they're tipping their hand for there is also the uh, calendar manipulation. Uh, I think she sa he says, you only have seven characters and it needs to have nine. And that is very interesting because it is our ninth month that is named seven, September. So it's very interesting. I think they were showing us calendar manipulation is a old age old oh, trick. Dude, I just had a big brain explosion. <laughs> okay. So one thing I've wondered about for a long time is like, why? Why the septenary? Why the septenary instead of an Ennead? And there's been some decent explanations given to me about that. I remember I talked to Marty Leeds. I asked him that question. And generally it was like that the one and two, my best way to describe it is that the one and the two being that they're like mere reflection of each other and thus both the one and kind of cancel each other out, that they don't need to be counted in the, you know, that's why there's a septenary. It's actually starting at three. This is reflected in the, um, what you call it, the, the so-called emerald tablets of Thoth or Hermes, which I don't know that I've, I mean, there's no reason to believe that that's actually from any, any ancient source. I, no reason to believe that at all. I mean, that goes for a lot of things, but especially that I've read it. I'm, there's interesting stuff in there, but like really skeptical about everything, right? So what is Disney always doing? Disney's always killing mom and dad, always getting rid of the parents. And wouldn't the one and the two, if you asked them from the Aeneid to yes. get a septenary, you're killing mom and dad. The J and the B. Disney's all about that. Yep. Interesting. Uh, kind of related, it just reminds me, Balderson the other day was saying that, you know, uh, when you look into Norse mythology, you're going to come across the nine worlds. But he was saying way back in the day, it was actually seven. And so he kind of uh, made the septenary septenary connection there with that, which I thought was kind of intriguing, which I had not heard before. Yeah. The, the only reason I can sort of think of is um, when you're doing the synodic periods and, and I've sort of based it on the 27 um, as a, as a period of time that all sort of correlate to each other. If you're looking at it as a um, they're working together basically there's there's fundamentals numbers that come out of it and seven is a, a really prominent number for that um it's also you know you've got the triangle and you've got the square joined together um that sort of thing so it does show up everywhere and um you know nine's really important as in zero to nine for you know our hands and things like that so I don't know. I think each number has a certain quality that should be, uh, shouldn't be ignored and, uh, you know, that they, they'll fit in certain places. Sure. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so I thought one of the intriguing things about Moon Knight, the first episode was the superhero reveal in the bathroom. It happens in the bathroom, right? The bathroom of the museum. And I'm like, it's in the bathroom. I always pay attention to bathroom scenes in movies. Kubrick was really well known for doing that. And I think there's a lot Supposedly of Supposedly like... that's where Jen hang out. Oh, what? Really? Yeah. In Arabic mythology, it's com commonly thought that the, the Jen hang out in 
the laboratory and you would always want to have like incense burning there to counteract the, you know, that, that spirit with a, a positive or healthy spirit of a good scent. And sorry to cut in, but yeah, no that's, uh, I mean, there is a gin thing going on there symbolically with him being taken over by an alter personality that. Oh right? yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, thanks for bringing that to my attention. Go for yes. it. And guess who the, uh, the built in mythological uh, antagonist to the djinn is the werewolf. And so the fact that he was being chased by a dog-like creature through the museum is very indicative that we're definitely dealing with that djinn energy with Moon Knight for, because it has that antagonistic relationship to the dog spirit. And I want to point out something else because, uh, I mean... It's going to be so hard to get every detail. It's going to be so difficult. But I just want to put this forward that the president of the United States at this moment, his name translates in Twilight language. I call him Joe Bay Jin. J Obey the Jin. So Joe Biden definitely has a relationship to Jin spirits, as did Obey Ma, his predecessor. Uh, very, very uh, gin oriented, more so than um, than werewolf. I'll just put it that way. Very interesting, man. Well, yeah, I mean, they did their homework and they encoded a lot of uh, lunar symbolism into that show. You know, the werewolf, too. You think of the moon and the full moon and everything else, right? And then it's obviously moon night. And then he's in the bathroom and then it gets destroyed. So there's like water coming out of like the faucets and stuff like that. So the watery symbolism. And then I thought it was interesting, too, that there were like uh, fluorescent lights like hanging from the ceiling and stuff. And so I think a blue light. And so some people say that uh, there's a quality to artificial blue light and uh, and its relationship to the moon. And that, you know, uh, the moon uh, potentially projects blue light and is cool and everything is more septic as well. Nice. Yeah. And uh, that sort of links up with UV, doesn't it? That sort of idea of UV light. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that defining moment when he beats the werewolf up in the bathroom and there's water springing up, that's the spring equinox. You know, I'm thinking. I'm definitely thinking that's the spring equinox that breaking across the barrier. Uh, j just an interesting point. Uh, yeah. Now that you're po po pointing out that bathroom significance. Yeah, sure. One thing, just an observation, you guys have seen way more MCU movies than I have, but he had a big studio apartment. <laughs> Thank you, snake. Um, and isn't that kind of like a thing with these types of movies that these guys always have these big, like open studio apartment sort of things. Like they don't never have design. like, yes, that is totally a thing. Great observation. I've heard that's a, that's a 5g agenda that they're pushing open layouts so that the 5g can travel more easily. Okay. Yeah. Less privacy that way. Interesting. Anyway, just a random Getting option. rid of those walls, you know, <laughs> no more terminus. And then uh, the trickster thing, I thought, and when he actually transitions, you know, over and then he suddenly like he's funny or what have you, you know, uh, I, I thought was interesting, too. And it's pretty classic. The whole MK Ultra thing. Oh, my God. You guys are going to have like a lot of things to talk about. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Everything going on with the mirror world that goes back to the, again, to the straw man identity. It's your, it goes to the metaverse idea. I mean, he's talking to, for people that haven't seen the show, he's talking to his alter personality, his MK Ultra schism, schizoid self uh, through the mirror. He looks at himself in the mirror and the mirror talks to him as a different version of himself. Right. That's uh, the mirror world is the metaverse. Yes. It is the legal fiction. It's all these things. He even and that's the Gemini too, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. He even 100%. goes into the wall and pulls out his cell phone and his keys. It's in the wall. His his alter ego is in the wall of his chamber. 
It's Wait, so and, and where does that alter ego come from in the bio biological birth process? Part of the uterine wall, right? Like that's part of what's coming out of mom. You got it. Yep. The after in the afterbirth. Yep. This is why your wallet is like a strange little vagina. That when you pull your ID out of your wallet, it's a birthing ritual. It's insane how magical everything we do in law is. It's all so utterly magical. We dress it up as these legal, legally binding things, but they are they're ritual. This is ceremony. It's a you know, it's a system that has been put in place long before we got here. It's, if it ain't broke, they ain't trying to fix it. <laughs> Yeah, Sarah Mooney. Oh, yeah. Back to the right. moon. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Right. S Sarah even relates to the harvest. So Sarah Mooney is the harvest of the moon, the moon harvest. Uh, you got series, yeah. Yeah. That's right. So Michael Tessarian has recommended a movie called The Devil Rides Out. And he was saying that it's fairly accurate and i i believe it's from 1960 something or other and one of the wildest scenes is this girl is driving in a car i think maybe she's the passenger but she looks into the rearview mirror and there's a set of eyes that aren't her own looking at her hypnotizing her through the mirror and so there's several examples of mirror magic in this movie that I think are really, really well done. And it kind of reminded me of, of some of the stuff happening in Moon Knight. And that's like a whole rabbit hole you can go down to, which I don't really know that much about. I just know it exists. I just want to pause on the word ceremony <laughs> a little more because it's kind of like Sarah Money or Sarah Mooney phonetically. And Sarah is actually an unused word that is the plural form of serum which is a watery fluid or, you know, what do you get injected with a serum? How many Marvel movies, the character becomes super powered because they're injected with some kind of a serum. And then Sarah, of course, connects to like, I believe Sarah Swati is a, like a goddess of a mother goddess of rivers or something. Right. Mm -hmm. Also Sarah, the wife of Brahmin, who is, is a Brahmin. <laughs> yeah. S Sarah means princess in Hebrew. Uh, and you say it in reverse, it's heiress, and an heiress is a princess. Yeah, so you're dealing with basically, yeah, Virgo and Libra, and they're dealing with seeds, they're also doing dealing with um measurements, the money, weighing things as well. Um, so law again with Libra, so yeah, that all ties in. I like that, the, the weights and measures of the ceremony, you know, making sure you got the right P's and Q's, pints and quarts. I get into scale symbolism in one of my Libra videos, and I talk about the hashtag or the octothorpe or the pound sign, right? There's a reason why it's called a pound sign. It actually has to do with weights and, and measures and everything. But one of the things... Octothorpe. Octothorpe, yep. Ooh, that's great. One Pounding of the, things, the though, Yeah. One of the things I uh, realized while doing the research was how the hashtag or pound sign has always been connected to like high technology. It's just one of the things that it's always been associated with. So when they yes. added it to the uh, number pad for phones, it was so that phones can communicate with computer networks, like really early computer networks, right? And so now I just, I kind of pay attention to the hashtag. And so it's number three on your keyboard or most keyboards, you know, which I also think is kind of interesting. I think that's kind of like a pretty prominent spot, right? Um, and then now Elon Musk supposedly, right, has bought Twitter and he's kind of like the Tony Stark futurist guy that we're all supposed to like bow down to and whatever. So it just makes me wonder, like, you know, uh, the future of the hashtag or the pound sign, like, where's it going to go? It's continuing this trajectory of always being associated with like high technology and everything. Because really, that that is how we use it nowadays, that most people acknowledge it as a hashtag. Yes, that is so significant. Everything you just said, that is so significant. Um, so uh, the Octothorpe chance, that is the shape 
that is the uh, icon of the window to the Sanctum in Marvel Comic Universe. The Sanctum has the hashtag as the shape of the window, and that's the also the shape that he has to do his little hand mudra to open up the um, the talisman that he wears. Yeah, um, and when the uh, the ancient one, the Tao, <laughs> the Tao, is showing him how they do spells, it, it's all this like hypercube eight pointed star symbol that she's drawing in the air. I'm waving my hands around wildly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll be right back, everybody. And then we've got a, a call-in voice message from Kaylee Burkana. So you guys nice. keep keep kicking it. I'll be right back. Yeah, Very cool. Same here. BRB. <clears throat> it's All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> righto. We'll, we'll keep going. But um, when, when you look at sort of Libra and um, Virgo, uh, you get the Libra is basically the... Um, Another name was the the frond and the furrow. So the, she was Libra was the furrow, and that's to do with you know um, planting the seeds and things like that. But you have got the technology there that actually, you know, creates the furrow. So it's part of that. Plus weights and measures and that. That's that's how you get technical advantage. You know, in in anything you do. Um, right. Yeah. Be, that makes sense. Yeah ropes and pulleys or whatever it is or measuring things or you just it just that that is where the the um sort of you know theoretical hits the, the the physical in a sense and creates something sure uh related to the seed you know the thoth deck the hermit card is ruled by virgo and the hermit is actually like looking through wheat that's being separated and kind of like the subtext is that uh, this phallic energy, the hermit, is looking to actually sow his seed. He's looking for his other half. He's looking for the, the, the divine feminine, I guess. And you could even say that he's looking for it within. So anyway, there's something there that you said that reminded me of that. That's interesting because what follows after Virgo is Libra, which is kind of like a reflection of Gemini and the fact that it's dual. Yep. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if you're referring to uh, the fact that, you know, Scorpio also being an M symbol. So you've got Scorpio with an M symbol, then you got Virgo with an M symbol, symbol, and then they're being balanced on the scales of Libra, which I think is really interesting. And I guess this goes back to the fact that there was at one point, uh, Virgo, Libra, and Scorpio were once one big constellation, and they got divided at a certain point. That is very interesting. That's going to be helpful. Well, look, yeah. looking at the nine month calendar and how it fits with the, our 12 month calendar. Um, I should point out that um, where um, Libra is, that, that's not where she really is, in a sense, because that's actually part of the um, Scorpion's claws. And so. The, the bottom half of Virgo is actually Libra, which is basically the um, two, her two legs and two feet, you know, they're in a sense, the scales. So um, it's the lower half of um, the Virgo figure. I see. I see. Okay. All right, guys, I'm going to play this uh, voice message we got from Kaylee. She may be asking us a question or making a comment. Or saying something wildly inappropriate or going in blind. <laughs> Here we go. Make sure, give me a thumbs up if, or just say something if it's not loud enough. So here's something to think about. Maybe all of this twin flame stuff with, uh, you know, especially going, well, you and I have talked about a chance. <laughs> Maybe all of this twin flame stuff is actually birth trauma and unconscious placenta separation trauma and stuff playing out and i've i've wondered for a little while if some of it is pushed artificially some of the hype about twin flame um if that stuff is pushed artificially to uh try to get us to continue to look externally for what is actually internal 
anyway, these are thoughts. So here's something to riff off of the uh, George Floyd stuff too. Um, <clears throat> 2020, when that happened, the north and south nodes were in the tropical sign of Gemini Sagittarius. So the eclipses, therefore, were in Gemini and Sagittarius. So these two themes here coming up. So that's really interesting. And then if we go off of LC's system of the tropical signs being the ones that are going to die, well, there you go. There's death and there's Gemini and there's the Gemini ritual. Um, the other thing that I kind of thought of earlier that um, I said in the chat was, it's, uh, it's interesting, um, the idea of Sagittarius being the union of man and animal, especially since the centaur is supposed to symbolize human and animal, or rising above your animalistic nature, with the whole themes of, like, higher knowledge and philosophy and etc. So, yeah, those are my thoughts. Thanks for that call in. You guys got anything to add to that? I like what she's talking about with the uh, the straw man, but kind of playing into that searching, searching without dynamic, that pulling of your uh, your yeah your self, your wherewithal you know, pulling it away from you, uh, creating the illusion that it is not with, uh, within. I totally dig what she's getting at there. And <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot going on with that. Oh, here's something, Mario, too. Another share. Oh, he just went off screen. Okay, I'll save this for when he gets back because it relates to his uh, Octothorpe. <laughs> this is interesting. I'll hold on. Yeah. I'll hold off on it, though. There's some good stuff in the call-in line. I'll share right now the link to everybody in the chats for our Telegram group that is the Vibrant call-in line. Uh, there's a lot going on in the actual YouTube and Rockfin chats sometimes, and I try to look at it all, but I miss it, miss a lot when you guys get really chatty. So to make sure something gets onto the show or catches my attention, ask a question, things like that, best place to do it, or leave us a voicemail or send an image to put on the screen. Best place to do it is our Vibrant Telegram group. Oh, here's Mario. Okay, so Kaylee shared this. Speaking of your Octothorpe, this is what the constellation of Sigma Octanus. Well, Sigma Octanus is a star, right? It's the supposedly the southern pole star. But the uh, constellation that it's grouped with is Octans. And mm -hmm. it kind of does look like, and kind of reminds me of a hashtag a little bit. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that one. Octans. Yeah. Huh. Very cool. And then Kaylee also had a question for Lucas when he gets back. <laughs> uh, we all had to go take a break. We've been here for two hours. But another thing that's in the call-in line that I want to share is a cool image of a hanging scroll from the Chinese History Museum of Fuxi and Nuwa, who are the twins in the Chinese mythology. And wouldn't you know it, they got snakes for legs, guys. Yes, exactly. Yep. Wow. And I one of them is holding a compass and the other one is holding a square. Wouldn't you know? Shut the door. That <laughs> is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's Kaylee's birthday tomorrow. Full gang, hey. so many strong Taurus folks in our thing, our group. Nice. Uh, for sure. Happy, happy breath day, Kaylee. That's for for yes. Kalina. You know, happy birthday. We're not supposed to call it birthday. For sure. Yeah. So uh, the question for Lucas was about Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. Can you see down in your fake country? Can you see those constellations ever? That was the question. Oh, you're muted there, mate. <laughs> no, I haven't seen them. No, sorry. Yeah, I think that's a little too. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm I'm pretty far south as well. Um, I'm down in Victoria, so the bottom end of Australia as well. So, 
I do see Orion's belt and things like that, though. So, um, and Taurus and and things like that. So, nice. You know what's related to this whole deal too and i lurked a couple of weeks ago on weaving spiders i was not participating but i was watching and very covertly i wasn't even in the chat but you guys brought up so much good stuff oh my god um and chance you brought it up you brought up the saturn chopping off the legs of mercury from tracy twyman's book right that book is a gift that keeps on giving i didn't even touch on it even though we talked about bloodbaths earlier Big right. part of that book. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. So uh, my two cents about that, I don't, I don't think you guys got around to this or whatever, but, you know, if we do live in a nested sort of system with rings or whatever, the, you know, the entities further out on the rings seems like they prey on the inner rings, right, sort of thing. So Saturn being further out, kind of like taking its hook and kind of doing its thing with the inner ringed people who are kind of younger, more naive, uh, closer to the mercurial sacred center and everything else. So it reminded so me on a of fractal that. level. That's are you actually saying our, are you saying our prior on things. <laughs> <laughs> you energy vampire. Well, we're talking though, like the idea that there's outer lands even further beyond, right? That, you know, the whole ice wall concept or that the uh, build that our sun and moon travel on, that there's a, further out ring land that Mars and Venus are the sun and moon of, and then a further out one than that, that Saturn and Jupiter are the sun and moon of, and that the realm itself goes through a gemation process where it grows out from the middle, like the rings of a tree and whatever the pole star is, whichever one is the mercury or the androgen is then divided. Well, I'm sorry, multiplied <laughs> into a, a new sun and moon for their realm and more landed and expands growing earth idea. But I wanted to point out that in the biofield, in our aura energy that is stuck outside of our central pole, our central column, our chakra system, it is actually vampiric. It is feet. It's pred predatory energy. It is just akin to demonic uh, possession or infestation or energy parasites because the the idea that as i understand it is that being separate from or far away from the source which is the central pole the battery if you will um means that to energize itself to continue to exist it has to be stealing or pred predating energy from that system so your stuck energy in your biofield is kind of like a, a vampire where yourself you're parasiting yourself in a way because you've divided yourself in that sense. That is kind of a true division rather than a multiplication because your total energy system is now less. You have less throughput. You can only, you only have maybe 80% access to yourself. If you have 20% of your energy stuck walled off terminus <laughs> compartmentalized somewhere else in your field. And the further out it is, the harder it is to see that it's happening to you especially that birth trauma that hangs out right on the very edge of your field as far out as possible because your field is like the rings of a tree. And depending on the age that a particular trauma happens, that's where the distance it is from your body. So like six feet away from you is the edge of your field. If you're a 30 year old, then three feet away from you, that zone of your body would represent when you're 15 and it works like that. You can do the math that way. And so that stuff that's really further out, you don't have memory at all of those ages, right? So And so it's been feeding on you for a long time. So it's kind of like more nefarious and more powerful in a way. But it's also you. And you can bring it back in and integrate it if you uh, do the work. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, dude. That is awesome. Yeah, no, I think you're going to find this dynamic basically everywhere. So you guys were talking about it and and Tracy was talking about it with money in the financial system, you know, older, um, you know, um, vampiric sort of entities or families or whatever, preying on the less knowledgeable, the younger or the older generation preying on the younger generation. But exactly what you just explained, I think that um, that dynamic, you're going to see it all over the place, you know, and Saturn too, with the cosmic egg, 
being very much related to boundaries and restrictions, I think of the shell of an egg, you know? You know what I just thought of? What is like a super scary parasite that people are afraid of is going to give them Lyme disease? Oh, my God. It's a tick. And what is Saturn? He's the Kronos, you know, Lord of Time. Tick tock. Tick tock. Mm. Tick -tock. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Great point. Yeah. It, and the other it, thing is Saturn would be, you know, the last anode. It would be the first anode in a sense. Um, and the anode is basically taking and giving to to the internal as well. So it's got that dynamic as well where it's pulling in um, and drawing in for, to itself to then give over. And so, when yep, it's integrated well, to the whole I'm system, that aspect or that archetype isn't malevolent in and of itself, right? Well, it holds the boundary for the whole, it, it keeps everything else in check. Um, if it wasn't there, if it wasn't that stable point to, to move, the other planets would be all just all over the place. It also reminds me too, of course, of the toroidal field, the Taurus field, right? It's the same metaphor, basically. But, you know, the hyperbola or the central spot, you know, where energy emanates and returns to, and then the energy that's further out. You know, and the whole system basically depends on each other. It depends on the inner and the outer. So Mercury in this instance would be the inner. And then obviously Saturn is the outer. And it works that way with the planets. We got another voicemail. This is a brief one from Firm on Me. And uh, in the chat here, I think she's going to give us a, cor a correct pronunciation of the, the twin divinities that we were looking at from Chinese mythology. So let me play this. Hi, Chance. Hi, everybody. Um, it's called Ni Wa and Fu Yi. Sorry, I get really excited. I get to share, um, you know, my heritage and some of the myths and things like that. I don't hear it talk a lot about in the community. So I get really excited about it. So thank you for letting me share. Really appreciate all the information. I'm so glad that I jumped on at the last minute, even though I was late, because um, it's just syncs up with a lot of information and history that I'm studying and covering about China. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for letting us know the pronunciation and about that particular uh, mythology. I mean, we need to look at all the different cultures of the world and we get, you know, divided artificially, even though this is the same story of the the same record that we're spinning on, but we get divided through the Tower of Babel language deal and think that these different cultures are so radically different that we should like be antithetical to each other, but it's all talking about the same stuff. It's all talking about the same stuff, that's for sure. Yeah, totally. Uh, one point I have to make in this conversation is that Castor and Pollux the two twin brothers, they also, they are often shown wearing the, the same egg. One has the pointy end of the egg. The other has the round dollar end of the egg. So they appear to be uh, different, but they are, in fact, two ends of the same item. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, my understanding is that a lot of hero twin myths say that they're born from a cosmic egg. And uh, related, I was going to say, though, the, the mythology that uh, she was just bringing up, uh, the first time I saw that image was from Hamlet's Mill. And Hamlet's Mill, uh, the mill idea is a metaphor. Thank you. Let's see if I can get it right here. Um, the mill is a metaphor for the churning of the cosmos, right? And so when yeah. I see these serpentine people um, twisting upward, I really think of the same caduceus symbol, uh, snakes going up the cosmic pole or mercury going up the pole uh, or the post. You know, this is where we do get the post office from and postage and, and things like that. You know, I have not made it all the way through Hamlet's Mill, though. It's a dry read. Nice. Good call. That's a great call. Yeah. Yeah. So once again, just like you were saying, Chance, you know, the symbolism really is all over the place. And that's why I like doing these decodes, too, is because you just realize how many similarities there are all over the world. You know. That's why we need everybody in the community to keep uh, 
also sending us information, adding it to our chats. Telegram is the best place for that. I think we're at the good point to start wrapping it up. <laughs> it's been a, definitely a really good weave. Thanks for coming on, guys. I'd love to do more Four Horsemen vibrants in the future. Totally up to make this a regular thing. So if I'm ever like shy a guest, a special guest, I'll just hit you all up. <laughs> and also, no worries. Any, you know, a lot of times we just, we have room in the second hour a lot of times for a, a live caller. And I'd be happy to take either of you gentlemen, either time, anytime. Uh, next week, Mario will be back with his girlfriend, Michelle. And we're going to be specifically talking about her work as an herbalist and any other topics that she wants to take us into. So that's going to be really fun. Excited to have you back then, Mario. And I'm sure Gabriel probably will be hanging out with us. I'll take it from here. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. There, there he is. There he is. And nice. Alex has a back button that hits back on the browser. Oh. I accidentally thumbed it and then boom, I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, yeah, you guys have any closing thoughts? Go around the horn. Uh, this uh, is th fun. Thanks for the sh Yeah, it's been fun. Been a lot of fun. And, um, you know, I've enjoyed you know, sort of learn as you go with these sort of things as well and, and make connections throughout. So uh, thanks, guys. Oh, happy to do it any time. Likewise. This is great. You guys are great. Um, because it's Taurus... Do you mind if I plug my Taurus poster, my Taurus prints? Because oh, I've sure. been thinking yeah. about it. Screenshot? I've been intending to. Oh, sure. Let me find it real quick then. I have the post right here, but you know how it is with lighting and stuff. So just one second. Yeah, I recently got uh, Mario's correspondence packet. It's freaking nice. beautiful. Yes, highly recommend it. And I, I got to get, get that. I didn't get to show off my book in the beginning. Everybody else showed off their books. So here's my book I got from Mario last week. Let's see. Nice, dude. Oh, Let's right see. on. Zodiac and the Salts of Salvation. Yep. Yeah, that's going to be a good one. A lot of symbolic literacy to be had for sure. Okay, I am ready. So let me share my screen here. All right. So this is my Taurus print. I designed it last year. I'm considering this whole series, by the way, um, almost just like a living series. So I'm going to continually update it as I see symbolism that's appropriate, right? Um, but this is available on my Etsy. And there's a lot of things encoded. Um, and it also actually includes a symbolic breakdown sheet. So I go into it and I break down why I included so many crescent moons as an example, or what uh, this arm gesture represents, right? Or why there's five pointed stars. And so um, anyway, that's available. I think it's cool. I think you'll like it. And then the other thing I have, and this is a digital download right now, but I have these symbolic correspondence sheets for the four elements. So there's air, fire and water, and then there's earth. But I have, you know, the platonic solids, the circular symbol, triangular symbol, keywords, concepts, um, all things of the sort, and all of the astrological signs are included. And this actually is a uh, name your price offering. So people have paid hardly anything and then way more than what I was expecting. <laughs> so you can get it for whatever you think is fair. But yeah, uh, symbolicstudies.com, you can find links to everything. Is that what my surprise in the mail is? Then you asked me for my address. <laughs> Maybe. I have no idea. Uh, Lucas, were you going to say something about the uh, cell salts there? All, and, oh, oh, got to tell people. Symbolicstudies.com is linked in the show notes, the description of this. You guys ought to support Mario's amazing work other than just benefiting from the research in his videos. Great dude. Great art. <laughs> so Thanks, cool. Thanks, man. Uh, well, yeah, I suppose I can. Um, it was 
basically those cell salts can be paired up and created there are just lots of different types of batteries with them and so when you're looking at the the body in that way you can actually um see those salts interacting i guess um uh, to create energy that's about it nice yeah gabe i thought you would like that front cover there the version i have does not have that and you're muted by the way i do i love it very useful thank you yeah yep. you got it nice dude well thanks for having us man yeah no loved it you guys are awesome couldn't do a show like this without the whole team uh there's one more voicemail in the call-in line so i want to go ahead and grab that also from fur mommy a brief little snippet so we'll play that and then we'll wrap up right on Hi, just one last quick message from Muriel. Um, I'm really glad that you brought that book up. I don't know if you heard about um, sand scraping. I think it's similar to the one to version that you're reading, but I'm trying to get through that as well. There's a lot of truth in that. It's almost like the um, Chinese version of um, the Bible. Um, so I'm interested to see that, what you have discovered from your book and, and maybe we can exchange some information. So, Sorry, it's me again. Sorry about that. But thank you. I'm just so excited to be able to talk about this with somebody. Yeah, and if you guys want to talk to Mario more on the reg, get into his Symbolic Studies Telegram group. Nice. Thanks, Chance. Uh, what was the book she mentioned? I couldn't quite hear it clearly. I was hoping you did. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that, too. The Chinese Bible, though. Maybe she'll type it in the, uh, the YouTube chat so we can see how it's spelled. Yeah, she really I should. She, I think she was talking about the salts of salvation here, but a, a book that is similar, closely related to it. Sounded like okay. okay. She said she'll drop a link for us later. Oh, nice. Nice. Again, probably. Very cool. I'm, yeah, I'm glad she came. Yeah, Definitely. I'm glad for everybody here. This is an awesome crew. The chat has been really fun to keep an eye on tonight. You guys are awesome, and thank you, Glenn, for the tip over on Rockfin. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. Well, we love all you guys. Thanks for hanging with us. We'll see you next week for another Vibrant with uh, Mario and Michelle. And watch out for the next episode of Interverse. I'm probably going to premiere tomorrow with the return of Clive DeCarl. It's also a really good one. So see you. See you all later. Love you all. Much love. Bye bye. Much love. Peace. All right, guys. Take see care. Ya. See you.